السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Am I audible? Waalaikum salam, ya Sheikh. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. And, uh, apologies for the late start. Trying to come to terms with the, the new time. And uh, yeah, just uh, again apologies for the kind of a stop start to these last few lectures um, between load shedding and Work commitments has been a bit uh, a bit difficult on my side, keeping you to us, inshallah. And um, uh, we will, alhamdulillah, today we, you know, back and continuing our series. So before we begin, it's been a bit of a, a gap. Are there any questions before we recap where we left off and then we can continue on? Are there any questions that anybody has? None? Okay, so then last week, or oh, well the last lecture, we spoke about substances coming into three types. We have those substances which are purifiers, which is basically liquid water. We have substances which are deemed impure or najis, and there's a list of them, there's a list of 10 items. And then everything else besides those, those two lists are called tahur, um, sorry, tahir, and they are pure meaning that they are spiritually clean but they are um you cannot purify yourself with it meaning you can't do perform wudu or any ritual of purification with those substances we then ask what happens if you mix these liquids together what happens and and again when we talk about purification most of the times it's it's liquids um, not so much in solids and gas so the rule in the sharia like we asked if you were to we know urine is a najis it's najasa if I were to urinate in a glass of water, uh, can I use that water? Everyone would say no. If I urinate in a pool, can I, or in an ocean, can I use the ocean water for wudu? I said yes. What about a pool or a bath? So I'm not sure. So it depends on how much water. If what we call in the Sharia a little water, a small amount of water, a small quantity of water, we call it anything less than two kullas. So this is an Arabic term in in in, in uh, kulla is a, is a measurement of water so two of two kullas or more is a lot if you have two kullas of water and you have to add najasa into it and the najasa doesn't affect the color smell or taste of the water then the water remains pure if of course any of those characteristics change then it is impure however if you have less than two kullas you have a little amount of water and any impurity is add, added to it, even if it has no effect on the color, no effect on the taste or the smell, then that water is no longer tawud, you can no longer use it for tahara. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, we then went through a list of what things are najis. Most of these things would be common knowledge to most of us, and we would assume uh, as such, human or animal ex excretions, like urine or excrement, so whether it comes from a human or an animal, any excretions are najis. So if it's on your body, it needs to be removed before you can perform salah. Blood, even though there is a distinction between types of blood, for our purposes to keep it simple, blood, whether it's from a human or from an animal, is deemed najis. You shouldn't perform in salah with blood on your garments. Madi, is, uh, uh, madi and wadi are types of discharge that exits from the private part, both for the male and the female, when aroused. So any liquids that is released from the private parts due to arousal is deemed, inshallah, najis. We said all types of milk that exits uh, a human or an animal that is not lawful for consumption, lawful for consumption, all types of milk except that. So all milk that exits an animal that from an animal that cannot be eaten, that cannot be consumed, is najis. So obviously the, the only milk which is not najis is human milk and the milk of animals that we can eat. Milk that can be consumed basically. A pus and discharge of, of, of wounds, vomit, uh, is deemed najis. Dead animals, a little complicated here. An animal, if it is dead, you have to first ask, is it a land animal or a water-borne animal? If it's a water-based animal, it's never najis. 
a water-based animal can never ever be najis. That's a rule in the Sharia. So when we even when we talk about najasa, we are only talking about land-based animals. A land-based animal, if it is dead and you cannot eat it, then it is najis. So an animal that is dead, that hasn't been slaughtered properly, would be najis. An animal that is dead, that even if you slaughter it properly, you can't eat it like a tiger, you slaughter it, you kurban the tiger, you still can't eat it, it's najis. The carcass is najis. But an animal that is dead and has been slaughtered properly and you can eat it, then it is it is halal. So a dead sheep that has been slaughtered. So you you cut a, 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 a sheep, you know, you slaughtered a sheep for kurban, you left that chop, um, a piece of him in the fridge, and then you take it out and... You know, some of him, some of those, uh, 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 you know, some of the, the fat or whatever came on your clothes, it's fine because you've slaughtered it. It's permissible. Insects are also not deemed najis. So if you have a mosquito or a fly and it sits on you while you're performing salah and you, you know, or, or, or you swat the mosquito and, and, and the body of the mosquito, the ant is on your clothes, that's not najis. So insects are, are deemed not to be najis. Insects are generally deemed not to be najis. Dogs and pigs, the entire dog and the entire pig, is deemed najis, living or dead. Um, so, uh, uh, and this is this is very so to make the distinction. For example, if you are performing salah and your cat sat next to you while you're performing salah, no problem. The cat licked you while you're performing salah, no problem. Um, of course, if the cat urinated on you, that's a problem because urine is najis. However, if the dog sits next to you and licks you, this is a problem. Okay, so because the saliva of the dog is najis, and similarly a pig. Then number nine, um, which we skipped over, and it's gonna we're gonna talk more about it now is alcohol. Alcohol has been historically deemed by the madhabs as being najis, as being dirty. And if any alcohol is on your clothes, you will need to remove it before you perform salah. Now one might say, but hold on, so many of our, um, you know, sanitizers, um, perfumes have alcohol in it. Does it mean that all our salah, when we used to come to the masjid, um, Allah protect you, subhanAllah, during the COVID times, we used to come into the masjid, we sanitized our hands, the alcohol was on our skin, um, because inside that sanitizer there is, there, is, there is a type of alcohol if you drink it, it potentially could intoxicate you so does this make you does it mean that we've been performing salah with najasa on us and therefore it's haram so this has been a, a, a it's a debate that uh, will give us an understanding of how Islam, the academics, what I want you to the answer is not important, what's important is how the scholars go about discussing this issue so as I said before, you need to always remember in, 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 in this area of in fiqh, you need to ask who must prove, who, on, upon whom is the burden of evidence? Is it up to me to prove alcohol is not najis? Or is it up to the other party to prove it is najis? Upon whom is it? And I'm asking the floor. Who should prove? Should I prove it is pure? Or should the other party prove it's najis? Online, guys? Somebody from online, please. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I think it's on the other person. To prove what? To prove that it is Najis. Okay, so you're saying you need to prove to me it's Najis. We take it as it's pure and you need to prove otherwise. Alcohol. Okay, does anyone have a different view? Okay, so, uh, wait, yeah? Sheikh, is, it, is it not uh, intention based, you know? Like if I drink cough syrup, I'm not drinking it to get drunk, I'm drinking it for my cough. So, Wade says, does intention not play into, remember we're not talking about sin or punishment, you won't be punished for urinating, but it doesn't change the fact that it's najis. So whether you, you intentionally urinate or you urinate by accident, that's not the point. The point is, is the substance itself najis? So, so in, this, in this discussion, intention makes no, there's no point of intention here. Well, I meant the intention of the product. So the, the product's in, intention is for, you know, to smell nice or to clean yourself or whatever in that case. Okay, so Ubaid says, if you use the, 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 the same product can be used for purposes of intoxicating you and that same product can be used for other purposes so if you are using it for intoxication purposes then it's najis and if it's used for non-intoxicating purposes not najis no 
this we're talking about here is this so the substance has a tick box next to it it's nudges yes or no irrespective of how it gets used irrespective of the intention in its in its essence in its nature it's deemed to be nudges that's the so so long story short it is not intention based it's nudges whether you use it for good or for bad it's nudges so the sister says Hold on, it's not for us to prove that it is nudges. Or we don't have to prove that it is pure. You must prove that it is nudges, and that is correct. Because the default is that everything is deemed to be pure. The standard, if we discover a new substance, it would be deemed to be, it is pure by default. Only if we prove it otherwise does it become nudges. So we say to those who say alcohol is nudges, you can't perform solar with perfume on, we say, okay, you bring me evidence. Where does it say that alcohol is najis? Who, who told you it's najis? Well, this is Allah says so. Allah said in the Quran, Ya you are ladina amanu. O you who believe, inna mal khamru, verily intoxicants, wal maysiru, and gambling, wal ansabu, and to, to uh, uh, sacrifice on stone altars, wal azlamu, and using divining arrows, fortune telling, Riches, it is riches, it is filthy, it is najis, min amri shaitan, it is dirty from the works of shaitan. Fajtanibuhu, so avoid these things, la allakum to so that you may be successful. So Allah says that intoxicants and gambling and slaughtering on, on altars to gods other than Allah and to, to, to fortune tell, all these are najis. So all these are riches, they're all dirty, so work away. So it's defilement. The Allah called khamar riches. And that is the standard definition and the reason why most of the Maghibs have said Khamar is Najis. And if Khamar is on your clothing, it is uh, haram to perform Salah until you remove it. That if Khamar is mixed with water, that water becomes Najis and so on and so forth. Who agrees with this argument from the classical view of the scholars and who has a contrary opinion? So the sister who said that, you know, the guys who say it's Najis, you need to prove and bring evidence. Is this evidence strong enough for your liking? Sister. Sister. Maaf, Sheikh. I was just distracted somewhere. <laughs> no, so, okay. <laughs> no problem. I, I muted the... No problem. Oh, sorry, Maaf. So, what sister, was the so remember, you yeah? said, you said that the person who is arguing for, to, to, to say alcohol is nudges, they must bring the proof, right? Yes. That's what you said. So he says, okay, here's my proof. My proof is in the Quran. Allah says, yeah, oh, you believe that verily intoxicants and gambling and slaughtering on altars other than Allah, and, uh, other than for, for Allah's sake, and to fortune tell is riches, it is najis, it is dirty. So there Allah says, khamar is najis. Are you happy with this, uh, this uh, uh, evidence to prove alcohol is najis? Um, I, I didn't catch what Sheikh was saying in, while I was distracted. I just remember in a previous lecture, um, which I noted very well, a Sheikh mentioned the default is that everything is pure. Did Sheikh speak about that now? Yes. Before? Okay. So we said everything yeah, okay. is the default, that everything is pure. And anyone who wants to, you know, account for something as najis, you must bring the evidence. So the one who calls something Najis, the one who makes something Najis, they need to provide the evidence. And so we say to those people who say Khamar is Najis, sanitizer is Najis, perfume is Najis, we say, you bring your evidence. Show us the way the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Allah said so. And they bring this ayah, Surah Ma'idah, verse number 90. Allah says, Veli Khamar is, raj, is riches, it is filthy. So Allah said it. So on that basis, alcohol is Najis, because they have evidence. Now, if you read the ayah, the counter to that argument, the counter to this argument is, Allah says, alcohol, gambling, slaughter, the altars upon which animals are slaughtered for gods other than Allah, the actual place, and the arrows which are used for fortune telling is najis, is religious, is, is dirty. So one might also, if a person gambles, he throws a dice, does he, does he become najis? Is the dice najis? Are the cards najis? We said, no, we don't mean it is najis. It means it's evil. It is sinful. Fortune telling is not najis in the sense that if you, if you um, picked up a horoscope that you, know, you now have to perform ghusl, we're saying, no, what is meant is it is from the evil actions of shaitan. It is sinful. That is what the ayah means. 
the riches here mean sinful, not najis. Because if you use if you use this ayah to make khamar najis, then you najis from a physical dirty sense, then you must use the same for maser gambling and the same for uh, um, sacrificing for anyone other than Allah and fortune telling of all types. All of that will become filthy. You must remove. You must wash it. No one washes gambling. You can't wash gambling away. You can't wash the dice and purify it. And so. The, the, the view is that this ayah should not be used to make alcohol najis because that's not the purpose of the ayah. And so, just to summarize, most of the scholars have deemed historically, look, khamar is dirty, and so if it falls on your clothing, it is najis. Modern day scholars have said, no, actually, alcohol in itself, it, it has an element of purification. You can actually wash the floor and with sanitizer, and it removes, it actually removes bacteria. It removes... Uh, uh, um, dirt. You, you know, before you take a, a, an, an injection, they first swab you, they w rub some, uh, uh, you know, that, that like a, a, some um, uh, material on you that has alcohol on it because it actually removes certain dirty substances, harmful substances. So, what is meant is the drinking of alcohol is haram. That's what this ayah is meaning. The alcohol, it is to drink, to drink it is haram and to sell it and all those kind of things. And so the argument here that alcohol is najis. Um, is as I said a classical view but can be re-looked at in modern times anyway the next question is um, dogs let's talk about dogs people own dogs and, and there's a whole discussion around permissible I'm not going to talk about the permissibility of owning dogs or not owning dogs someone asked a similar question on what basis is is it that dogs are nudges where do you get this you need to bring evidence well yeah, it's clear evidence. The Nabi says, when a dog drinks out of a bowl belonging to any of you, he must wash it seven times. So if you have a, a bowl or a bucky and the dog eats from it, before you use that bowl again, you must wash it seven times. Another, another version, the Nabi says, when a dog drinks water in a bowl that belongs to you, you must wash that container seven times and one of them is with sand. So six times with water and one time with sand. And that is why many of the Sahaba, <coughs> or many of the, Sahaba, the scholars have said, the most ajnas, the most dirty of dirty things is the saliva of a dog. Because if a pig urinates in a bowl, you don't need to wash it seven times, you just wash it one time, no problem. But if a dog licks, licks it, so obviously there's a lot of, we know, now we know, subhanAllah, now we know that in the saliva of dogs, many times there is a, a virus called um, dogs can have rabies, and you know this is perhaps one of the this, you know subhanAllah, rabies one of those diseases that there's no cure if you have it um, you know if it's treated too late you you, you know you, you, there's no cure and you go mad you know it's one of them read up on, on rabies and so we know that the the science behind it that it is very dangerous the saliva of the dog potentially can be quite dangerous and therefore. From our Sharia perspective, the Nabi Sallallahu recommended or advised, commanded that if a dog licks your utensils, you should wash it seven times. And it then also, SubhanAllah, one can imagine, if any of you owns dogs, for a dog to lick you, any part of your body, is extremely bad. Now, Islam is not against dogs. You can't hurt dogs. You can't mistreat them. It's good. You're allowed to own them for specific purposes of hunting and protection. But you should not have the dogs lick you or lick your clothes or lick um, the, 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 the utensils you eat from. That is not permissible. The saliva is najis. Um, the urine, of course, is najis. One might ask, what about their hair? So I can protect me from them licking me or urinating on me. But what about their hair, their fur? The hair gets all over the place. So if you have a cat, for example, everywhere you sit is cat hair. You know? So this is another masala. Is the hair of the dog najis? And in reality, as we said, najasa is about wetness, it's about liquid, and so, inshallah, most likely the hair of the dog is not najis, the fur of the dog is not najis, and so if, you know, a dog brushed up against you and some of the hair stuck on your clothes, you could still perform salah, but of course it is safer to not have uh, um, a dog fur on the clothing of your salah, where you perform salah or where you perform salah. Okay, removing najasa, how do I, so let's say a dog... Uh, uh, you know my, you know uh, uh, the, the the baby urinated on my clothes. The the cat um, defecated on the on 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 the floor. 
how do I remove the najasa? How do I remove the, so the impurity is there, I need to get rid of it. It's very technical. The vast majority of the scholars, the majority of the scholars have said that removing najasa is an act of worship. It's an act of ibadah. So there's a physical component where you actually have to remove the, the najasa. All traces of it must be removed. The color of it, the smell of it must be removed. And you need to use water, liquid water to, re to remove it, to purify it, because it's an act of a ritual of removing najasa. The minority view, which is the view of the Hanafi Madhab, and makes a lot of sense, they said, no, you don't have to use water. If you, if you remove the najasa through dry cleaning, for example, or you used chemicals to remove it. So long as the, the najasa is gone, that's the whole point. There's no reason to, to use special kinds. Of, you don't have to use a ritual. It's not an act of worship. It is just getting rid of the dirt. Again, make, we simplify it. The baby pees on your clothes. Is it najis? Absolutely najis. So now you take the clothes and how do I remove it? Well, one view is you just make sure the, the stain of the pee and the smell of the pee is gone. Whatever you do, you can dry clean it. You can, you know, if you put water with soap in it, so you have soapy water and you wash the clothes. So obviously after you use the soapy water, the clothes, the najasa is removed. Great, fantastic. The majority of the scholars will say that clothes is still not clean. I said, why? No najasa in it. I said, you have not used pure water. The water you use is not pure because it's mixed with it's mixed with soap. You need to remove the najasa, which you've done good, but then you must also wash it, rinse it with pure water. Now this added rinsing with pure water, they said that is a ritual of ibadah. Now that's the view of the Shafi Madhab, the Maliki Madhab, the Hanbali Madhab, the Hanafi Madhab, and you'll get this. The Hanafi Madhab is a lot more um, historically has been a lot more uh, what do you call it? Um, you know. They would look at the the the, the purpose based. They would be they would look at what is the objective. And so they said the objective is to remove the najasa. That's the purpose. And so long as you remove it, it's gone. If you used water, you used soap water, you used handy handy, you used whatever it is. So long as the najasa is gone, it's clean. And that makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, every time you clean your floor, you must use after you mopped it and washed it, you need to use a layer or, or a, a, a a bit of clean water that has no soap in it to wash it, to make it pure from a Sharia perspective. Is everybody understanding this? It's a bit complicated now. Anyone understanding it? You don't understand it? Yes, I do. as alaikum. Yes, I do, uh, okay. Sheikh. Okay. So what would you agree with? Do you agree with the Shafi Madhab or the Hanafi Madhab on this one? I would agree with the Hanafi. Hanafi madhab, you say it makes sense. So, so if you, if someone like, you know, is it a dog, uh, uh, urinated on you, and you take it to the dry cleaner and they just use a powder to clean it, no water, is it fine? Mm. <laughs> okay, you must use pure water. That's how you are. Well, that's that's that, that's your. Uh, that depends. It depends on the on the on the um, on the. Your, you see, this this is where and this is why. Once you get into the detail, you realize why we have different madhaib and why we have different schools of thought. And alhamdulillah, it's permissible to have different views. Both have their arguments. The majority of scholars will say, look at what the instance of the dog. One wash would have been enough to get rid of all the impurities. You know, you lick the dog, lick the bowl, you washed it one time, it's all gone. Why must you wash it seven times? So they'll say, you see, there's a ritual. There's an act of worship. There's an, like a, an ibadah to this thing. Where's the Hanafi saying, no, so long as the, 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 the objective was to get rid of the najasa, it's fine. So in the end, inshallah, um, as I said, my view, and you shouldn't just follow blindly, but my view is, again, I also agree with the Hanafis on this one. That so long as the najasa is removed, inshallah, it's fine. Otherwise, you're going to have to wash everything with water after you've removed the najasa. Okay, moving on to, inshallah, something a little bit more, little easier. Uh, this whole first section, 
very technical, very complicated, was to make you understand what substances are, the different types of substances, and how do we remove them, and if, if najasa, najasa is upon your clothes or on your, 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 your area, how do you remove it? Now we're going to talk about wudu. So, we said before you perform salah, you need to purify yourself. So, just purifying your clothes is good. Purifying the area you perform salah is good. But you yourself have to be purified to before you perform salah. Why? You're about to stand before the Lord of the universe. You're, allowed to sta you're not about to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before you approach Allah, before you speak to Allah, there is an etiquette, a decorum, there is a procedure. And so Allah subhanahu wa doesn't want you to dress up in fancy clothing. Allah doesn't want, it's not for only for the rich. Allah doesn't want you to have uh, um, all kinds of, of uh, makeup or perfume. Allah wants you to be clean. You mustn't be in a dirty state when you stand before him. The first command, and this is trivia for anyone, what is the first command Allah gave Nabi Musa? The first command Allah gave Nabi Musa was, remove your shoes. Come, when Allah spoke to Nabi Musa from the burning bush, Allah said, Oh Musa, you are in a very holy place, take your shoes off, because his shoes were probably covered in dirt, or najasa. So you're about, to, you're about to speak to me, you're about to speak to Allah. You need to be in a purified state. So wudu. The Rabbi Sallallahu says, the jewelry of the believer on the day of Qiyamah, that will cover, or the, will cover to the places where the water of ablution reaches you. The things that will shine on the day of Qiyamah are those areas that will perform wudu. In fact, this Ummah will shine compared to other nations on the day of Qiyamah because of our wudu. We're the only people that five times a day, you wash your arms, you wash your feet, you wash your face, you rub your head. So on the day of Qiyamah, inshallah, it will be quite clear who the Ummah of Nabi Sallallahu is because of the, the wudu that they perform. My Ummah will be called in the day of resurrection with their limbs and faces shining from the traces of wudu. So whoever among you can increase the area of his radiance should do so. So what does it mean increase? It doesn't mean that if you must perform wudu up until your ankles, you wash all the way to your knees. No, that's wasteful. It means perform as much wudu as you can. Whenever you break your wudu, take a new one. Always be in the state of wudu. It's a good sunnah, if possible, to be regularly in the state of wudu. Just to be in the state of wudu is an act of worship. Anyone who perform, So these are all hadith about the importance of wudu. Anyone who performs wudu and performs wudu excellently, you make sure you do it properly, his sins will fall off his body even coming out from under his nails. Another hadith, it's like if you you shake a, a branch, the way the leaves fall down, that's how your sins fall off when you perform wudu. So just imagine while you were, you know, subhanAllah, during the day you looked at haram, you listened to haram, you spoke haram, all the kind of haram things you did, there you perform wudu. And as you are washing, that sin is falling away, it is being removed. Now, again, think of in the terms of najas and purification. As we perform sin, as we do sin, those stains are on our body. Those stains are on our soul. And then you perform wudu, and those stains fall off us. Those sins fall away from us. Alhamdulillah, they dissolve in the water and they disappear. Alhamdulillah. And, and as you know, so, so this is the beauty of, of, of wudu. And it's just to add on the importance of wudu. Allah does not describe how to perform salah in the Quran. Allah doesn't say, you recite this, then you do that, then you perform ruku. But He describes in detail how to perform wudu, subhanAllah. So it shows you the importance of, of wudu um, um, within our, our religion. Now, getting back to those, those are all virtues and benefits and nice things. So nothing to do with fiqh. Let's get back to fiqh. So we said, the reason why we're talking about wudu, we know, why am I not talking about hajj? We're talking about zakah. We're talking about fasting. Why are we talking about wudu? Ubaid, why are we talking about wudu? Um, because salah is one of the five pillars and you need wudu to make salah. Correct. We're not actually talking about wudu, we're talking about salah. Why are we talking about salah? Because that's the first thing. You become Muslim Islam from scratch. I accept that Islam is the way of life. I want to be a Muslim. Where do I sign up? What do I do? We say, now, first thing you need to do, brother, after the kalima, is you must make salah. I said, okay, I'm going to rush to the, I'm going to go to the masjid and make salah. Wait, wait, wait. Before you make salah, we need to teach you how to perform wudu. Because you can't do wudu, or can't perform a salah without wudu. Now, on the way, this revert, he said, oh, okay, great. Before I make salah, I need to perform wudu. Okay, you're going to show me how to perform wudu. Then he says, hold on. Is there anything else that requires wudu? Ubaid. Is there anything else 
any other act of worship that requires wudu. Yes. Uh, reading the Quran. Okay. Uh, and okay. When you go out, cut some of the. Okay. Very good. So, he's paying attention. So, remember, we said the guy asks you. Okay, before you perform salah, you need to perform wudu. He says, why? Because you're approaching Allah and you need to purify yourself. So he says, okay, so every time I do an ibadah, I must perform wudu. Before I pay zakah. So before I put the money in the towel, I must perform wudu. We say, no, you don't need You don't need wudu to pay zakah. Okay, when I'm fasting in Ramadan, can I f- fast without wudu? He said, yes, you can fast without wudu. You sleep during the day, you don't have wudu, but you're fasting. So Ubaid reminds us that for... For certain activities, you do need wudu. So there's only three things in the whole sharia. You don't have to worry about it. Only three things where one needs to be in the state of purification to do these acts of worship. Number one is salah. Any type of salah, whether it's compulsory or optional. Whether it is in jama'ah or it's alone. You have to be in the state of wudu to perform salah. Number two, when you perform tawaf, you have to be... In wudu, you have to have wudu to perform tawaf. Tawaf requires wudu. So around the Kaaba, when you perform, whether you're performing tawaf for Umrah or for Hajj, you have to have wudu for every tawaf. And when you touch the Quran, the Mus'haf, not recite, you can read, you can recite from memory, you can read from a distance. So let's say I, you know, uh, 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 you sitting in the class and there's Quran on the board, you can recite it, you can read it, no problem. You can listen to it without wudu, no problem. But you cannot touch the mushaf without wudu. And for each one of these, again, these evidences, and we won't go into all the evidences around to, around the evidence of tawaf, the evidence of touching the Quran, that's beyond our scope, inshallah. But now let's talk about wudu. How do you perform wudu? And within this, and, and as I said, Allah mentions it in the Quran, uh, uh, in Surah Ma'idah, verse number 6, Allah describes how you perform wudu, and He gives a detailed summary of wudu. And um, in that, there's going to be a number of questions. So Allah subhanahu says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O oh, those of you who have iman, O oh, believers, إِذَا كُمْتُ مِنَ الصَّلَةِ Before you, st- when you stand up for salah, فَغْسِلُوا first, wash your face. فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Wash your face. وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ And your hands. إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ To your elbows. وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ and rub with, and I'm reading, like literally translating here, yeah? and rub with your head, your heads, وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ and your feet, إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ to your ankles. Okay, so just stop there. We just stop on that. So, Allah says, Oh, you believe when you stand for salah, wash your faces and your hands to the elbows, wipe over your heads, wipe with your heads, and your feet to the ankles. Okay, we stop there. From this, are there any, for those of us who have performed wudu our whole life, what's, what, what is a bit odd about this? What do we find strange about this? This verse. Is this how you perform wudu? No, Sheikh. Why? How do you perform wudu? There's the hands, the nose, the, the mouth, we do all the... Yeah, all As, those in between as well. Astaghfirullah. You're performing wudu and not going according to the Quran. Ya Allah, we're not following the Quran. <laughs> right, so we know, so someone will tell you, no, hold on. The Nabi Sallallahu he obviously, um, he obviously performed wudu, and from his sunnah, from his wudu, we see a few extra things. And so, when we looked at the way the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi performed wudu, he always started by washing his hands first. Now, now to understand why he washed his hands first let's say in in the past you didn't have a tap you had a bucket of water right and now your hands are full of grease full of dust full of sand and you put your hand in the bucket of water to wash your face what did we learn just a few minutes ago if water is mixed with something which is uh, uh, not pure or mixed with anything else and the color of the water changes can you still perform wudu with it If you had, no. sorry, go ahead. No. No, you can't. No. It... Exactly. You can't perform wudu with water that has changed. It's been contaminated. So the Nabi Sallallahu 
out of his wisdom, he says, before you put your hand in the bucket of water, first wash your hands. So, we wash our hands first in following the sunnah, although we say it's not compulsory. If you don't start by washing your hands because your hands are already clean, there's nothing on it. It's fine, it's permissible, but you'll get rewarded for washing your hands. Also, when I'm sure, Ubaid, when you wash your fa face, you wash it three times. Yes, in wudu? Yes, sir. The ayah doesn't say three times, it just says wash your face one time. So that is also something from the sunnah. The Nabi sallam, when he washed his face, he washed it three times. And so, one time is compulsory. Two times is good. Three times is sunnah. Four times is bid'ah. We don't do four times. It's waste. So, we follow the sunnah in that we wash our face. We also see that Nabi sallam, when he performed wudu, he washed his hands to the wrists first. Then he rinsed his mouth and his nose out. He put water in his mouth, goggled and spat it out, and he sniffed water up his nose and he blew it out. This is not in the ayah. And so many of the madhabs have said it is part of the sunnah to wash the mouth and the nose. Although some madhabs have even said it's, well, it's part of the face. Some madhabs have said, no, 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 the mouth and the nose is compulsory. You don't have a choice. You must wash your mouth and nose. It's part of the face. So their definition of face includes the mouth and the nose. For our purposes, we'll say that the hands, the mouth and the nose is optional, whereas the entire face from your, the top of your forehead to the bottom of your chin, from the left ear to the right ear, that circle is your face, and that needs to be washed at least one time to have wudu. Then Allah says, and your hands to the elbows, and wash your hands up until the elbows, and this includes the elbow. So if you wash and you stop at the elbow, you have not performed wudu. You need to wash all the way, including the elbow. And then Allah says, and wipe over your heads. Now, what happened here? The verb changed from wash to wipe. From wash to wipe. In Cape Town, how do you wipe your heads in Cape Town? In Cape Town, how do people wipe their heads when they perform wudu? Anybody? So Bait says here in Cape Town we take our hands that are wet and we wipe the forehead and the front of your your kaif, the front of your head. That is not how the Nabi Sallam perform wudu. And it's not how the ayah describes performing wudu. The ayah says you need to wipe over your head. Wipe over your head. Your entire head must be wiped with a wet or damp hand. And that's how the Nabi Sallam performed wudu. The Nabi Sallam, and we know very clearly, when he wiped his head, his hands were wet, and he did this. He wiped over his head completely and brought it forward, or the back of his neck, and he did it one time, and that's it. And the ears as well, he he wiped in the inside of his ears. Now one, now this is how the Nabi Sallam, and that's the sunnah, to wipe your entire head. The question is, is it enough to wipe just the front part of your head? And this is a very deep technical discussion, which is the Shafi Madhab uh, is well known for, um, and it all revolves around this bar. If you know, so Allah says, "Wamsahu and wipe bi ruusikum." Wamsahu means wipe, ruusikum means your heads. So wipe your heads. This is extra bar Allah put in the Quran, and wipe with your heads. Some scholars have said that bar means wipe your entire head. The Shafi Madhab says, no, the ba means a part of your head, a portion of your head. That ba is to say, so <coughs> in the Shafi interpretation, the ayah reads like this, and wipe a part of your head. The rest of the Madhab says, no, the ayah says, and wipe all your head, all of your head, or wipe your head. Do we want to know why the difference of opinion here? Do we want to understand why? Shafi argument is Allah added the B for a reason. If you took it away, wamsahu ru'usikum, wamsahu ru'usakum. If you recited the ayah and wipe your heads, it would imply all of your head. So if you add the bar and you still wipe all of your head, then you're saying the bar is of no use. The bar is extra. But do you understand that? Yeah. If you took the bar away and you read and wipe your heads. The meaning would be wipe your entire head, right? 
Yes? And wipe your heads. If Allah didn't put the bar there. Because if you read the rest of the first part and wipe your and wash your face. It's understood, wash your entire face. Correct? Yeah. Are you with me, Obaid? Yes, sir. So Allah didn't put a bar and we wash our entire face. So if he took the bar away, you would have wiped your entire head. So by adding the bar, it must mean something different. This is the Shafi argument. By adding the bar, he didn't add the bar in front of head or face or hands or feet and we wash our full face our full hands and our full feet so the bar must imply less a portion of do we get that a part of and he gives Imam Shafi gives evidences in other parts of the Quran where this bar is used to mean a portion of so for example Nabi Musa he grabbed Nabi Harun's head when he was very angry with him when he came back and he found the people worshipping an idol he left Nabi Harun in charge and then Nabi, Mu, Nabi Harun said my brother don't grab bi, bi ra'si, bi ra'si he put the body don't grab a part of my head now everyone agrees Nabi Musa didn't grab the whole head of Nabi Harun he grabbed the front part of his head so, Nabi, so, so Imam Shafi says this ba means rub a portion meaning the front part of your head the rest of the scholars said no from the sunnah from our understanding you wipe your entire head nonetheless perhaps the Shafi Madhab is correct that the compulsory part is to rub the front but it is sunnah to wipe your entire head so inshallah we conclude with this for your benefit and for my our benefit it is best it is recommended that you wipe your entire head from the front to the back and this is the sunnah to do inshallah and may Allah reward you in that we'll continue next week um, are there any questions any questions? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum um, If I may just ask, Sheikh, uh, maybe at the next, uh, okay. Sorry, just sorry. If, you touch the, the, you if we touch the Quran. Yes. I know Sheikh said it, it, it's a deep topic. Yeah. But I but I heard someone else say that it is not necessary. I am just. Yeah. Although I always have wudu when I touch it, I would like to know. Yeah. You need wudu to touch the Quran. Okay, that's our question for. In yes. fact, with with this, and, and I think we we need to change the 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 name of this course is no longer from scratch. It's quite deep stuff. We're moving on now. Um, but what I want for everyone, if you have a question like this, do the research and we discuss it next week. That's the best way we learn. So, uh, Sister Hafsa, um, you go and Google. Does touching the Quran require wudu? You know, and let's see yes. what the scholars say. Read up and see what you come up with, and we'll discuss it next week. Shukran so much. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, there is another one from me, Sheikh. Okay, go ahead. Um, because it's going, it's going it, it affects myself, although I am going with the mahram, inshallah, and yeah. intending to go for Umar. Uh, and someone said to me, it's actually not necessary, it's not that necessary to have a mahram. But I prefer to go on the safe side, and I'll do some research on that as well. Okay, traveling. Um, so, so, so the issue of traveling with with or without the mahram, uh, it's a deep again another deep conversation and deep deep topic, but um, not within the scope of tahara. But inshallah, we can discuss it next week as well. Inshallah. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Anyone last comments before we conclude? Jazakallah khair. We'll continue inshallah next week. Shukran so much. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.